On the 24th, the protesters clashed with the police with tear gas being used. On the 29th, the protesters formally listed their demands. These were formation of a committee that would cooperate with the European community, resignation of Yanukovych, Azarov and his cabinet, ending the repression against Timoshenko and other members of the opposition. The next day, the violence escalated, as the heavily armed Bekrut special forces attacked and tried to disperse the protesters. The police chased them off the square and besieged a monastery where most people took refuge. Official reports confirmed that 79 people were injured in the attack. In the following week, the number of protesters grew, and on December 8th saw the event now known as the March of a Million, as most of the opposition members claimed that as many as one million people took to the Maidan Square. That same evening, the protesters toppled the monument of Lenin, with the group shouting, Yanukovych, you will be next. On December 11th, another clash with the police followed, with Bekrut trying to disperse the protesters in the early morning hours. Protest leader Vitaly Klitschko referred to the police's actions as senseless and brutal actions by the authorities. On the same day, Azarov announced the breakdown of negotiations between Ukraine and the ECU. On December 17th, Yanukovych and Putin signed the Ukraine-Russia Action Plan, which consisted of Russia buying $15 million worth of Ukrainian eurobonds and lowering their gas prices by almost a half. In response, the opposition blocked the parliament building, while Klitschko publicly denounced Yanukovych, saying he had given up Ukraine's national interests, given up independence and prospects for a better life for every Ukrainian. On December 21st, Volodymyr Meralov, head of an anti-corruption activist group called Road Control, was attacked by two men in Kiev. He was shot in the chest and had his car burned down. The attackers claimed it was a part of an ongoing effort by the officials to stop the organization's reporting on police corruption. The next day, 100,000 opposition members and non-partisans formed the Maidan People's Union, with its main goal being spreading Euromaidan's ideas to eastern Ukraine, where the party of regions was still extremely popular. On January the 3rd, a member of the Svoboda party, Andrei Ilienko, and his lawyer, were brutally attacked by police and received severe injuries. Svoboda called this attack an attempted murder. On January 16th, the Verkhovna Rada passed several laws commonly referred to as anti-protest laws. These included up to six years in prison for blocking access to buildings, up to two years in prison for gathering and disseminating information about Bekrut members or their families, up to one year in prison for defamation, either by press or social media, up to 15 days in prison for unauthorized installation of tents, stages and sound equipment, anti-mask law, up to 15 days in prison for participating in a peaceful gathering with any kind of mask or camouflage on, legal governmental internet censorship, and disallowing NGOs and churches from supporting civil protests. The laws were described as draconian and quickly became known as the laws of dictatorship. From then on, the protests took a really violent turn. On January 19th, 200,000 people descended onto Kiev and marched to the parliament building via Khrushchevskoho street, where they were met with police cordons and military vehicles. Tensions escalated and the two sides began to clash. What began as peaceful protests had just turned into full-blown riots. On the 21st, after the anti-protest laws came into effect, Yanukovych ordered a bloody crackdown of the rioters. Interior Minister Vitaly Zakarchenko authorized the use of physical force, special devices and even firearms. The next day, two people were shot and killed by the police. After that, the protesters dispersed and retreated from the area of the Nemo Stadium before returning a few hours later. Eyewitnesses recall police firing indiscriminately with rubber bullets and life ammunition, hitting dozens of people. 
January 22nd was the bloodiest day of the riots, with five people killed and 300 injured. The next day, Zakarchenko issued a formal apology for the unacceptable actions of people in police uniform. The turmoil continued until January 28th, when Azarov handed in his resignation and Yanukovych signed a decree dismissing his cabinet and repealing the anti-protest laws. The protests continued through February without much escalation until February 18th, when 20,000 people marched on the parliament building in support of changing the constitution of Ukraine to the one after the Orange Revolution. This event marked the beginning of the five-day-long revolution of dignity. Protesters clashed with the police forces yet again, with 26 people killed in the first day only. The next day, police checkpoints, blockades and restrictions were put in place and a de facto state of emergency was declared. On February 21st, Yanukovych and the opposition signed an agreement which promised to return to the 2004 constitution, early elections and withdrawal of security forces from Kiev. The same day, Yanukovych fled Kiev for Kharkiv, then Donetsk, and crossed the border into Russia with the help of special forces on the 24th. Three days later, a caretaker government was formed under the leadership of Arseniy Yatsenyuk, with Alexander Turkenov as acting president. However, in Moscow, seeing how things were unfolding and knowing that Yanukovych had lost control of the country, Vladimir Putin called a meeting on February 23rd in which he remarked that we must start working on returning Crimea to Russia and on the night between February 26th and 27th Russian troops entered Crimea. In the early hours on February 27th, 2014 60 Russian mercenaries seized control over the Crimean parliamentary building in Simferopol. The same day, in a clearly fraudulent election, the Crimean government was terminated and a new one was formed under the leadership of Sergei Aksyonov. In the next few days, the Russians seized control of the airports in Simferopol and Sevastopol. The Russian fleet stationed in Sevastopol forced the Ukrainian fleet and coast guard to withdraw from Crimea. By March 8th, the Russians were almost in complete control of the region, and on March 11th, the Supreme Court of Crimea passed a resolution in which it proclaimed Crimea and Sevastopol as an independent country and intended to hold a referendum on March 16th. In said referendum, Crimeans had a choice between joining Russia and returning to being a part of Ukraine. 96.77% of people voted for joining Russia. On March 17th, Crimea officially seceded from Ukraine and requested full accession into the Russian Federation. This request was granted almost immediately, with the Treaty of Accession being signed the next day. At the same time, pro-Russian protests raged on in eastern Ukraine particularly in Donetsk Oblast. On March 1st, protesters seized the Donetsk Regional State Administration building, but were pushed back a week later. In April, thousands of people gathered in Donetsk, demanding a referendum like in Crimea, and on April the 7th, crowds stormed the RSA and proclaimed the Donetsk People's Republic. That same day, unrest began in Luhansk, which culminated in Luhansk People's Republic being proclaimed on April 27th. The acting president of Ukraine, Oleksandr Turkhinov, ordered an anti-terrorist operation to quell the separatist movements in the East. Since then, the Ukrainian armed forces, supported by the SBU, engaged in skirmishes against the separatists actively supported by Russia. Notable cities that fell into the hands of the separatists were Sloviansk, Mariupol, Kramatorsk and Horlivka. On July 17th, the separatists infamously shot down a civilian Boeing 777 flying from Amsterdam to Kuala Lumpur over Hrabove, killing all 298 people on board. 
In August, the Ukrainian forces laid siege on Ivovysk in an attempt to regain control over the city. Twelve days into the fighting, on August 14th, regular Russian troops entered Ukrainian territory. The Ukrainian advance was halted and they had to retreat to Novozavodsk. A few days later, on September the 5th, the site of the conflict signed the Minsk Protocol, which ensured an immediate ceasefire on both sides. Humanitarian corridors were made to allow civilians to leave the affected areas, and Petro Poroshenko, the newly elected president of Ukraine, granted a special status to Donetsk and Luhansk. Despite the protocol being in effect, the ceasefire was being repeatedly violated by both sides, and by January 2015, it had completely collapsed. On February 12th, the second Minsk Protocol was signed, which guaranteed amnesty for belligerents on both sides, ordered an immediate ceasefire and removal of heavy weaponry and artillery. By that time, the war had entered into a stalemate and more resembled trench warfare. This stalemate continued all the way until 2022. After Poroshenko became president, he swore to put an end to the war in Donbas, but also to integrate Ukraine closer with the Western powers. Integration with the EU and NATO was put as a priority in Ukrainian foreign policy, and in 2017 Poroshenko finally signed the association agreement with the EU. In late 2014, a committee of lustration was set up, with its purpose being removal from office of public officials who worked with Yanukovych and those who worked with the Soviet party. By September 2015, over 700 officials had been illustrated. The new government also passed the new anti-corruption laws, setting up the National Agency for Prevention of Corruption, National Anti-Corruption Bureau, and Specialized Anti-Corruption Prosecutor's Office. However, Despite all these reforms, Poroshenko lost the 2019 presidential election to Volodymyr Zelensky. Prior to the election, Zelensky was an actor and comedian, starring in a series called The Servant of the People, and many people, including his rivals, took his candidature as a joke. When the results of the second round came out, it was a landslide, with Zelensky amassing 73.22% of the votes. Their reactions were mixed. Poroshenko tweeted that a new, inexperienced Ukrainian president could be quickly returned to Russia's orbit of influence, while other critics expressed concerns whether he would be able to stand up against the oligarchs and Putin's Russia. At the same time, Russia was issuing internal passports to the residents of Donbas, effectively treating them as their own citizens. Zelensky saw this as a step towards annexation and began integrating closer with NATO. On September 14, 2020, he approved a new national security strategy, which provides for the development of the distinctive partnership with NATO with the aim of membership in NATO. On March 24, 2021, Zelensky signed a decree which approved a strategy of reintegrating Crimea and Sevastopol into Ukraine. This initiative later became known as the Crimea Platform. Ukraine's foreign policy interests were now in a direct collision course with Russia's. In early April, Russia started to build up its forces on the border with Ukraine. In May, one of Putin's advisors, Nikolai Petrushev, said that Russia may use forceful methods to avert unfriendly actions that threaten the sovereignty and territorial integrity of the Russian Federation. In October, Dmitry Medvedev described Ukraine as a vassal of the West and that any negotiations with them at this point are pointless. By November, Russia had amassed around 100,000 troops on the border with Ukraine, which alarmed the West. Additional Russian forces had also been moved to Crimea. In January, the Russian embassy in Kiev was evacuated for, at that time, unknown reasons. Later that month, Russian troops entered Belarusian territory. In the early days of February, Jake Sullivan, 
National Security Advisor of the US, stated that Russia might invade Ukraine at any time after the conclusion of Beijing Winter Olympics, and the US administration ordered all of their diplomats to evacuate immediately. On February 17th, fighting in Donbas began to escalate. On the 21st, Russia officially recognized the independence of DPR and LPR. And then came the fateful day. This is what Russian President Vladimir Putin unleashed on Ukraine. Gunfire and explosions have been heard here and in the second city of Kharkiv shortly after the Russian President Vladimir Putin authorized a special military operation in Ukraine's Donbass region. Vladimir Putin has just addressed the Russian people moments ago, announcing what Putin called the start of a military special operation. Мною принято решение о проведении специальной военной операции. On February 24, 2022, 5.30 a.m., Vladimir Putin gave a speech in which he announced the beginning of a special military operation in Donbass. He called on the Ukrainian army to surrender and warned against foreign intervention. Shortly after, Explosions began to sound in major Ukrainian cities, including Kiev. Zelensky declared martial law and ordered general mobilization. The Ukrainian resistance was fierce, as the Russians failed to take Irpin, Hostomel and Bucha. Despite that, the Russian forces continued advancing from the north towards Kiev, with the intention of rapidly taking control of the city. The battle lasted for more than a month, with the Russians trying and failing to encircle and blockade the city. On March 22nd, Ukrainian forces launched a counterattack and regained control over the capital and its surrounding areas by April 2nd, with the Russians retreating as far east as Kharkiv. As the Ukrainian forces recaptured the Kiev Oblast, they discovered the first of many Russian atrocities. In Bucha, at least 20 Ukrainian civilians were reported dead, and a further 280 found in mass graves. In April, the fighting shifted heavily to the southeast. On April 13th, more than 1,000 Ukrainian soldiers surrendered in the besieged city of Mariupol. Those that kept fighting held out at the Azovstal Iron and Steel Works warehouse. Later that month, explosions were heard in Transnistria, a breakaway state in Moldova unrecognized by the international community with the exception of Russia. The alleged attack was described as an attempt to sow panic and fear. On April 28th, Russia seized the entirety of Kherson Oblast, and on May 11th, Russia stated that there will be a formal request to make the oblast a part of the Russian Federation. On May 17th, the remaining Ukrainian forces in Azovstal surrendered and were evacuated, marking the end of the siege of Mariupol. On June 27th, Russia launched missiles at a shopping center in Kremenchuk, killing at least 20 people inside. Zelensky described this as not an off-target missile strike, but a calculated Russian strike. In early July, Russia seized control of the Luhansk Oblast. On July 22nd, both countries and Turkey signed a treaty lifting the blockade of grain exports from Ukrainian ports. In early August, the Zaporizhzhia nuclear power plant, now under Russian control, began showing signs of instability. On August 29th, Ukraine launched a counteroffensive in the south to recapture Kherson and Mykolaiv, and on September 6th, another counteroffensive was launched to capture Kharkiv. On September 20th, the Russian Duma passed a resolution prohibiting voluntary surrender and making refusing to obey a superior's orders in the military illegal. On the next day, Putin announced partial mobilization. Authorities of DPR and LPR announced referendums to be held between 23rd and 27th of September, with an intention to be annexed by Russia. Also on the 23rd, a mass grave was discovered in Izium with 436 bodies 
being exhumed. On September 30th, DPR and LPR were formally annexed into the Russian Federation, along with Kherson and Zaporizhia Oblast. In response, Ukraine officially applied to join NATO. On October 10th, Russia launched a full-scale missile strike across the entire Ukrainian territory, killing at least 23 civilians. Putin claimed this attack to be a revenge for bombing the Crimean bridge three days earlier. Alexander Lukashenko also announced that Belarus and Russia would form a joint regional group of forces. On November 11th, Ukrainian forces entered Kherson, recapturing the city and part of the Mykolaiv Oblast. In response, the Russian airstrikes escalated. On November 15th, a missile hit a Polish village of Przewodów, killing two civilians. Accusations were thrown at Russia for hitting a non-belligerent country, and Polish leaders held an emergency meeting. Further assessment revealed the missile to be an Ukrainian anti-air defense missile launched to intercept a Russian one. From then on, the war had entered into a stalemate with no noticeable progress on either side. The number of casualties is hard to estimate. On December the 2nd, the Ukrainian government reported about 13,000 Ukrainian soldiers killed and more than 30,000 wounded. However, the estimated casualties are believed to be at least 100,000 dead and wounded. BBC News Russia reported on February 14, 2023, that 14,093 Russian soldiers were killed. Once again, the estimated number of casualties is way higher, reaching more than 150,000 dead and wounded. The UN confirmed that as of January 22nd, as many as 7,068 civilians have been killed and 11,415 have been wounded. The Ukrainian government estimates these numbers to be as many as 41,000 civilians dead and wounded. In total, about 34,161 people have been confirmed killed and at least 41,415 wounded with the estimated amounts of at least 291,000 dead and wounded combined. So, what does the future hold for Ukraine? As of recording this video, the invasion is entering its second year and there are no signs of stopping from either side. One thing is certain, Russia is waging an aggressive war and Ukrainians are bravely defending their homeland. We can only hope this conflict ends quickly and with Ukraine regaining control of all their territory.